Amen, amen. Let us pray. Dear precious Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we're about to look at your word, we ask there, God, that you'll open hearts and minds to hear your word and to respond to your word. And cleanse me now, Lord, in such a way that I can preach and say, Thus saith the Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. I don't know when last each of you has been to Jamaica, but if you've been to Jamaica in the last year or two, especially if you drove through Kingston, you're probably wondering the same thing I'm wondering. Is Jamaica really a third world country anymore? Because there's certain parts of Kingston, it's like you're trying to pretend to be in New York. They got the big electronic signs everywhere. There is so much technology in Jamaica. I mean, whoo! Some of the people out there are getting the internet speeds faster than I get where I live. I'm not sure if Jamaica is a third world country anymore. They've come a long way with technology. But back when I was in high school, I never even heard of the internet. Back in high school in Jamaica, uh, you said internet to me, I think you were talking French. In fact, when I was in high school in Jamaica, the only people who had computers were the big companies with the big money. Everybody else was doing things the old paper and pen way. I was fortunate though. My uncle, who was a bank manager, he may have been one of the original guys who started this. He used, to, he used to always fly to Miami, buy a whole bunch of stuff, come down and sell it for twice as much. After a while, he started hearing about Higglers. He, he was one of the first to do it. So when he was not at the bank, he was in Miami making probably more money than he was making at the bank, just buying and selling stuff. On one of those trips, he decided to get me a computer. Now, I was probably the only or one of the very few people in my high school as a teenager who had a computer. Obviously, some of, their, some of the young people, their parents who were well-to-do had computers at work, but I was one of the few, if not the only teenager that I knew of, at least, who had a computer. But here's the problem. As much as I'm glad that my uncle got me that computer, it didn't really do my social life at high school any good. For you see, I was already obsessed with electronics. I took it so far, and some of you have heard the story before, I would take my electronic tools and some electronic parts with me in my school bag to school just in case I got a crazy idea and I wanted to work at it right there. I did not want to wait till I get home. And that was all well and good until some of the other high school students found out about it. I don't even want to tell you some of the nicknames they called me. Because I, I, I had to leave Jamaica to put that nickname behind me. If I tell you now, it will stick like glue. I'm not telling you. Especially the worst one. And West back there would love to hear it, I know. But when I got a computer, it made matters worse because it turned me from an electronics nut into probably the very first nerd anybody at my high school had ever seen. I was probably the only nerd that they had ever met at that point in time. And trust me, all the popular kids went out of their way to invent all kinds of painful ways to let the nerd know he was not wanted. Don't hang around us. Don't come near us. We don't want none of that nerd stuff rubbing off on us. You were not accepted. You were rejected. Even the, the, the PE, the physical education coach, didn't want me around. He would sign me off and give me an A-plus for the class just for not showing up. Nobody wanted the nerd around. So can you imagine what would have happened if a nerd like me in high school actually received an invitation to go to one of the parties from some of the hottest teenagers on campus. I guarantee you that would have meant so much to me, I would have done everything I could to step up to the occasion. I would have done everything I could to dress right and to act right so that I could fully enjoy the fellowship of the popular kids. Whether or not it happened is another story for another time. But speaking of fellowship, those of us in here who are Christians, God has invited you into fellowship with Jesus Christ. My question to you is, did you step up your game? Did you do everything you could to conform to the standards of Jesus Christ so that you could fully fellowship with him? And years later, 
Are you still conforming? Still stepping up or have you slipped back into your old ways? Let's talk about it. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 to 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 to 9. Today, we will be continuing the series of sermons that I began two weeks ago. Last week, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Today, we'll pick up where we left off and go all the way down to verse 9. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You should have no trouble following along. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 to 9. The first two verses read, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge. Enriched in everything. I don't know about you, but I have a feeling that there's some people in here who so need a big financial blessing that when they saw the phrase enriched in everything, they probably started to think, oh good, pastor's going to tell us how to get a, a rich money blessing from Jesus today. God, pastor's going to tell us how to get Jesus to drop some big dollars in our bank account. I'm sorry to tell you, that's not what today's verses are about. However, some of us really do have some real needs. And since the Bible does say in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's take a moment and pray for those people who really need some kind of heavy duty blessing from God. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we pray and ask for your mercy and your grace over everyone who is truly in need of a blessing and a miracle from you. For you are the God of all comfort. And you are the God whose hand, is whose hand is never too weak to save. We ask for your mercy and your grace according to your word in Philippians 4.19 which says, Our God, my God, shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Please, Lord, pour out your blessings on those in need. Enrich them in every way, especially with the fullness of your peace that passes all understanding, that they may victoriously face their Goliaths because of your miraculous provisions. Amen. Amen. Getting back to our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 reads, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge utterance and knowledge now what does it mean by utterance we can pretty much conclude what knowledge means but what does it mean by utterance well if you happen to have the new living translation bible in front of you uh, and you have the niv you might notice that the way verse the way verse 5 reads is a little different than the way I read it. In fact, if you look in the NLT, instead of the word utterance, it has eloquent words. If you're looking at the NIV, instead of the word utterance, it has all kinds of speech. When you put all of these together, what it means is that God, through Jesus Christ, has equipped the church at Corinth with a large number of very effective and highly skilled teachers and preachers who are able not only to teach those outside the church unbelievers who Jesus is and to lead them to Christ but also equip them to encourage those who are in the church not to lose heart and to continue to passionately serve Jesus Christ but it says in verse 5 that they were enriched in everything through Jesus Christ how did God enrich them with this utterance and this knowledge well, God has no limits. God has many, many ways to do this. However, I'll give you one example that took place not long after God ordered Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people free. Here's what happened in Exodus chapter 33, verses 30 to 34. It reads, and Moses said to the children of Israel, see, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, 
to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. And he has put in his heart, meaning the heart of Bezalel, and he has put in his heart the ability to teach in him. And, so it's not just Bezalel, and Aliho, Al Aholiab, the son of Abon. Some of these names are hard to read. And he has put in his heart, meaning the heart of Bezalel, the ability to teach in him, and Aholiab, the son of Ahishsamach, of the tribe of Dan. What do we have going on here, even though some of these Old Testament names are really hard to pronounce? What we have going on here is God doing two things. There are many, many, many. God has no limits as to the ways and the methods. But here we have an example where God has done two things. God has equipped these two guys, these two men, one spiritually and by divine intervention and one in a practical way. The first one, Bezalel, God chose to fill him with his Holy Spirit and instantly equip him, instantly fill his mind with all of the skills and the talents and the knowledge to build the very things that God commanded through Moses that his people should build in order to worship him. So God did it miraculously for Bezalel, and then God did it something practically. Because through Aholiab, God gave Aholiab and Bezalel the ability to teach others. So God, in that example, we see where he used two of his endless methods. He used divine, immediate inspiration and equipping. And he also used a practical method, providing teachers to teach others to do the same thing. What we have taking place in the church of Corinth, it doesn't tell us exactly how God did it, but I believe that God used at least two of the many, many ways available to him. To some people, I believe God equipped them spiritually and supernaturally with the gifts and the talents and the ability and the knowledge to go out there and preach the word of God to the people outside and to the people inside. And God also, I believe, equipped the church with teachers to pass on that skill to others. And God is still doing this today. I mean, seriously, have you ever been in a situation where you are praying and asking for God to help you in this situation? And, and, and you're praying and asking for help. And out of nowhere, the Holy Spirit just drops some amazing insight in your mind. Drops some knowledge in your mind that you know you didn't have before. Or, as I think is God's favorite way, stirs up a curiosity in your mind that you would have never thought you're like wait a minute i wonder how such and such and then you go and investigate and all of a sudden pop up beam, your eyes are open to something you would never have thought of before or have you ever been struggling with something you've lost something or you don't know how to do something and you're supposed to do it and you you thought you could do it and you're struggling and either god just whispers and says Look under that pillow in the corner, the very pillow you would have swear was the last place on earth to find the keys. You're, you're so sure you would have never looked there. You look at again, the keys right there. Or you're struggling, you thought you could do it, and you know to, and God just sent the right person at the right time, in the right place, with the right attitude to show you how to do it. Your eyes are open and the person disappears and never see them again. God still does this. Sometimes God does it like he did it for me. Arrange for somebody who should have sued me to pay for me to go to seminary to study to be a pastor. God has all kinds of ways to do it. And what I just told you, I can't prove it. I'm not making it up. I actually have the records to prove that. God has all kinds of ways to do it. So here's the thing. However, but, but you, you also notice if he provides teachers... And you're a believer. Your job is to pay attention in class. And not to goof off and skip and try to get a grade that you didn't deserve. But however God has provided you with ability, knowledge, skill in whatever area. Do you realize that even if you're an accountant. You can do accounting in such a way to show the world what Jesus would be like if he did accounting. In whatever way you are equipped by God. The question is. What are you using the skills and the knowledge that God gave you for? Are you using it for yourself? 
or to glorify God. I want you to know that when God equipped the church at Corinth, even though the people who he equipped were to some degree personally benefited, he equipped them so that they could go out and do the work of God. So for all the skills and talents and knowledge that you have, in what way have you used it to expand the kingdom of God? And if you haven't, or you haven't done it in a while, do like me. Everybody, one, two, three, take a deep breath. You know, to go to the doctor and I tell you, take a deep breath. You're like, I've been breathing since I come in here. Why do you want me to breathe now? But do like doctor. One, two, three. No, deeper, Marsha. You have to breathe deeper than that. Come on, man. You, come on. One, two, three. Ready? If the person beside you can't hear your breathing, that means you're dead. Let's try this one more time. Can it, one, two, three. Ready? If you can still breathe, that means you still have an opportunity to step up your game and to begin to use your skills and your talents and your knowledge to glorify God. Amen? Amen. Moving right along. Reading verse 4, 5, and 6 together. I thank God. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you're just tuning in online. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verses 4, 5, and 6. I thank my God always concerning you. For the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and knowledge. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Now, if some of you are not reading from the New King James Version, you probably already noticed that verse 6 didn't read anything like what I just read. If you're reading from the New Living Translation, or, I mean, there's so many translations now. Okay? You probably notice. Is different. What's the reason? In the original ancient Greek, the style and the writing and the language of Greek they use proved very, you know, you have to understand, English is a very simple language compared to these ancient languages, you know. Those ancient languages are kind of like Creole and kind of like Jamaican Patois. They not only capture the message, but they capture the feelings and the emotions and so many other things in it. So translating it to English is not easy. This was one of those verses that were very difficult. However, just using the version I have here, verse 6 says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. The minute you realize that the testimony of Christ is a fancy way of saying the gospel of Jesus Christ, the minute you know that when you read back your verse, you realize that all the versions you're reading are saying the same thing. It's basically saying this, even as the gospel of Jesus Christ was confirmed in you. It means proven. In other words, it's saying, even as... The events in your life demonstrated to all who were watching that you really are a Christian. Can you imagine what would happen if the deacons decided in order for you to remain a member of this church, you need to prove to them that you're a Christian. No, 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 no. Don't, don't get me wrong. You know, they have not made any such decision. They have not, I repeat that, they have not made any such decision. But if they decided to come to me, look at Deacon Masha smiling. You were thinking about that? Oh, Lord of mercy. He was probably thinking about it. So if they decided to come to me with that, I'm going to, before I tell them yes or no and give them permission, I'm going to say, Deacon Marshall, um, Deacon Chris, you know how people had to deal with these days? How exactly you plan to implement that strategy without starting a war? I would need for them to explain it to me. But they have no such plans. But I wonder, how could we apply verse 6? To each and every one of us. But since some people are, let's just say, interesting, let me apply it to me. It says, even as a testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Confirm means prove. I don't know if you've ever been to a job interview. And when you go to the job interview, the, 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 the boss takes up your resume and says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you say you can do this? Oh, really? Oh, oh, you say you can use the computer? Go, go over there and prove it to me. You ever, you ever had one of those situations? Well, if you've never had one of those situations, let me tell you something I have. You know how I, you know how I can say this? Because this church did it to me. When I put, gave them my resume, my resume said, I can preach. You know, they said, uh-huh, really, you can preach? Okay, guess what? You preach for three months. And we will take our time to confirm that what you said on your resume is true. And if at the end of three months, we realize that you can preach then, you can be your pastor. Well, I'm the pastor. No, so apparently, uh, somewhere along the line, I was able to confirm that what I put on my resume was true. I ask you, as a Christian, 
How can you apply this verse to yourself? Is there evidence in your life that you really are a Christian? Let me give you a different example from my life. No, I can give you a plenty of examples, but let me give you the most recent one. Last month, I was driving to my mom's house, you know, to eat dinner and eat too much and all that good stuff. And when I was almost at my mom's house, my car started to overheat, to struggle, and all kinds of smoke was coming out of the car. Now, my mother lives in Pembroke Pines, that's what, I don't know, 20, 30 miles from here. Nowhere near my mechanic. And the car obviously couldn't make it back up the side. So half, about half a mile from my mom's house, no, about a mile from my mom's house, there was a mechanic. Um, so I went over there and pulled in. The guy looked at the car and he told me, this is going to cost you seven, actually he told me more than 700. I negotiated it down to 700. Now I got to tell you now, I, had, I was figuring to myself, 100, 150, 200, $700! I had plans for that money! But here's the problem. It is almost five o'clock. My car is already in his shop. And if I get it towed up to my mechanic, that will cost me, and my mechanic may charge me the same or more. So I figure, yeah, it's already here. Let him fix it. He fixes the car. I get pick it up the next day, drive it home. Five days later, same problem again. Of course, you know that $700 is burning me even more. Because I didn't want to pay it to begin with. I figured if I'd at least taken it to my mechanic that I trust, he told me 700, I'd be okay with it because I trust him. But somebody I don't know, and the guy don't even speak English that good. So I'm like, could it be he charged me this much because I don't speak Spanish? I mean, I don't know all kind of stuff running through your head when you feel you're not being treated right. So, of course, I took my car back to the same mechanic. I said, you say you fixed this five days later, it's given the same problem. Warranty repair. He has his mechanic look at it and come back 10 minutes later. Oh, no, sir. Something else is wrong with it. We need another $700. Say, you must be out of your cotton picking mine. You charge me $700 to fix it. The same problem that you want to charge me again. Listen, I knew I'm a pastor, but I had my car immediately taken to my mechanic. My mechanic looked at it and said, it's going to cost $700 to fix it. I don't know about you, but I can do a lot with $700. Okay. I am not pleased. So since my car is going to take a day or two to fix, I call an Uber. I get in the Uber, and it doesn't take long for even the Uber driver to realize that supposedly nice, peace-loving pastor is not happy. Now, I've lived long enough to know that when you are angry and upset, it is very easy to be mean, and it is very easy to, be, um, to not be kind at all, and it is very easy to tell people, no! When you're angry, it is very easy to be negative. When you're angry, it is very difficult to be nice and kind and positive until you calm down. I don't know, maybe it's just me alone have that problem, but when I'm angry, I need to calm down before you ask me certain questions. The Uber driver, I don't know whether he had some dreams in his life of being a counselor, but I'm driving and he's trying to talk and find out why. He gives me an opportunity to fully vent my feelings. That wasn't a good idea because I'm in the back seat and you know I can talk loud. I don't need a microphone for Sunday morning. By this time, if, you ever, if you're familiar with 441 and Broad, there's always somebody at the stoplight, pan, what do you call it, panhandling, begging for some money. So we're at the stoplight, and I'm in the middle of passionately telling the Uber driver how I feel because I feel I was ripped off and taken advantage of, and there's nothing I can do about it. You know, and, and this is what is really bothering me because I was taken advantage of. If I just taken it to my guy to begin with, my guy would honor his warranty, and I, I'm, I'm just... Very upset because I was taken advantage of. That bothered me more than the money. And here's a very strange thing. While I am venting, and I'm glad the Uber, maybe the God assigned that Uber driver so I could get it out of my system so when I come to church I could be calm. While I am venting, 
something happened and I, it's not, you ever do something and it's like you step outside and you watch yourself doing it and you can't believe you're the one doing it? That, that never happened to you before. You're doing something. You know you are doing it. You know you didn't really plan to do it. And it's like you come out there and say, my God, what on earth am I doing? I am venting to the Uber driver. I see somebody at the stoplight panhandling, begging for money. I tell the Uber driver, wind on your window. This is why I am happy, mad enough. Wind on the window and signal that man to come over. The man comes over and I give him money. As soon as he takes the money, my head drops like this. Oh God, you mean to tell me the gospel of Jesus Christ has so gotten a hold of me that while I am angry and venting, Jesus is still using me to do his work. No, don't get me wrong, you know. Pastor G, don't get it right all the time. But that day I did. And the reason why I hung my head is because I realized it is things like these that confirm that I'm a believer. When we as Christians find ourselves doing what Jesus would do, even when our feelings are telling us to do something else, it is things like these in our lives that help to confirm that we really are a Christian, that we really belong to Jesus. I wonder, could you document any evidence like this in your life? Enough evidence to convince people that you are a real Christian. Scripture continues. Now, some of you may notice something on a particular person. You may know the person, a good friend of mine, Miriam. Some of you may know the person. Actually pointed it out to me. Miriam said, Pastor, why do you keep rereading certain verses over and over again when you preach? Well, there are many, many, many reasons why I do it. One reason is because that's my style of preaching. Another one of the many reasons is because the real power in a sermon comes from God's word, not my words. However, in this particular case, the reason why I'm going to reread the previous verses is because the next verse, verse 7, don't make much sense unless you read all the previous verses before it. So now that you have probably found out after all these years why sometimes Pastor G read the verses over and over again, those are three of the many reasons why I do it. Back to verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, so that you come short in no gift. Come short in no gift. As we get further and further down in the book of Corinthians, you'll realize the gifts he's referring to is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So can you imagine this church, Paul says, came short in no gift. Can you imagine what service was like on a Sunday morning? I mean, they had people filled with the, the gift of healing, the gift of tongues, prophecy, wisdom, discerning between spirits, interpreting dreams, and on and on and on again. That church was full of Holy Spirit-filled, empowered people. Can you imagine? People come to church, and there's a crowd outside waiting to get in at 7 a.m. Pastor opened the door, and they nearly crush him coming in. And seven, um, 12 hours later, pastor is begging them, oh, no, please go home now so I can get something to eat. Can you imagine what service was like? People getting healed, demons getting cast out, people prophecy going back and forth, and dreams getting interpreted. You don't want to go home. That church was the hot stuff, man. But while some of us would love to have the gift of healing so that instantly we'd have <clears throat> millions of people following us and we'd have our own ministry on TBN with the money just flowing in, it's all about me and what I can do. Look at the focus of the members of the church. Verse 7 says, So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of Christ. Not eagerly waiting for the crowds to follow you. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly waiting. I know in my life, Whenever I was eagerly waiting for something, I used all the time I had while eagerly waiting to fully prepare 
for the event. When I was, when I was a kid, eagerly waiting Christmas, I used my time to find out where my parents were hiding the gifts. When I was eagerly waiting, you ever got to a family reunion and somebody said the wrong thing, and you can't wait to leave? Oh, you have your bag packed and ready, even though you're staying for a week. You have bag packed and ready to leave because you're eagerly awaiting. You can't stand this word. You're gone now. Why do they have to bring up this? We're talking about eagerly waiting. One of the probably the best examples is those of us who can't wait for the Black Friday sales. Those people who are eagerly waiting for them, you know they have their money ready a long time. You know they have their shopping strategy ready a long time. You know they've already booked and planned and told their boss they're not coming in that day, they use a vacation day so that they can be fully prepared to be in line at, I don't know what they, how early do they join the lines for Black Friday? 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning they've already checked out which store are going to have the best sale at the best price, they've already gone to the store two days before to find out what is the shortest path to get in here when the crowd comes in the morning they are eager, they are ready and they are waiting there's something about eagerly waiting that says you are prepared. The members of this church were eagerly waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ. They were eagerly waiting for the second coming of Jesus. That means they were prepared. They wanted to hear, well done my good and faithful servant. So while they were waiting, they made sure they were prepared. They did everything they could to please Jesus. They made sure that whether they were waking up, going to bed, buying gas, all that they did and everything they thought and did, they did it to please Jesus. They were ready any minute now. If Jesus came, I, want him to, I don't want him to come and find me doing what I'm not supposed to be doing. Can you imagine a passage if, if, if Jesus came and found Deacon Marshall in a strip joint? He spent 35 years doing everything he could to please Jesus. And he made one slip. And that's the day Jesus decided to come back. No, I have no evidence he's ever been to a strip joint. No evidence at all. I was just using that as an illustration. But can you imagine if Je the Bible says Jesus will come back like a thief in the night. Meaning you don't know when he's going to come. Jesus will come back. And he said, why he couldn't come yesterday? I was preaching yesterday. I have to catch me here. Do it. Are you and I living the kind of life that says, I am eagerly waiting for the return of Jesus? Just pay attention to what's happening around us. He could come any minute now. Verse 8. It says, well, let me back up to verse 7. So that you will come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blameless. So me is saying, but Pastor G, how can Jesus declare me blameless? Because Pastor G, if I ever tell you all of the horrible things I've done, since I became a Christian. I am not even sure if they're going to let me into heaven. So how can Jesus declare me blameless on the day of Christ with all of the stuff I have done? I'll tell you how. Because if you truly repented of your sins, and if you truly accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, getting into heaven has nothing to do with what you do or don't do. Getting into heaven has everything to do with what Jesus did for you on the cross. Then pass if that is the case. Why the Bible almost on every page is telling us we must obey. I'll tell you why. The reason why God and the Bible emphasizes obedience so much is because God is anxious and looking forward to bless you above and beyond. God is looking for ways to reward you, to encourage more obedience. And not only that, God wants you that when you get to heaven, you don't just barely get in. God wants you to get in with a grandiose reception because of all you've done to please Christ. Getting into heaven is not based on what you do. It's based on what Jesus did. The extra rewards and the crown and all the amazing things. You, 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 heaven is just not, just not about getting in, you know. There's a lot more to heaven than you realize. And you can affect your status in heaven based on how you choose to please Jesus. One of the best ways to do it. He said, the more you and I obey Jesus... It's the more evidence we give to those around us 
that we belong to Jesus. The more evidence we give to those around us that Jesus makes a difference. The more, and we establish for ourselves a platform of righteousness from which to tell others our testimony about Jesus. And the more we do this is the more we attract or lead other people to the kingdom of God. And that is what pleases Jesus and that is what gets you the extra rewards in heaven. So why is God encouraging you to obey? Because God wants to bless you. He wants when you get to heaven you are received with a grandiose glory. And not only that, God wants you to be his best advertisement so that more and more people will avoid hell and wind up in heaven. Your obedience is not about you. It's about others being attracted to the kingdom. And in the process, when you do it well, God will reward you to encourage you to do it even more. But if you don't want to obey, you'll barely get into heaven smelling a smoke. But if you really accept Jesus, you'll get in. But you don't, I know that there's nowhere in heaven, nowhere in the Bible that it says the smell of that smoke will ever go away. You really want to be carrying that smell your entire time for eternity. Everybody in heaven says, yes, welcome you to heaven, but you barely made it. Verse 9, speaking of, Jesus says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. You know, when they call you into work, they're not calling you in to do as you please. They're calling you in to do what the boss pleases. Likewise, when you are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, you're not called in to do as you please. You're called in to do the things that please Jesus Christ. Let me, let, let me put it another way. Many of us Search scriptures. And in the scriptures, you will find descriptions of ways you can position yourself for a blessing. You will find all kinds of descriptions and miracles all over the Bible. And in many places, it tells you how to position yourself and how to seek after the greater gifts. These are all wonderful blessings. The Bible does talk about it. And many of us, when we come to church, or when we go to a Bible study, or when we watch a sermon online, the only thing we're interested in is how can I get blessed? How can I get blessed? That's all I want to hear. And if we can find a church that every son is talking about how you can get blessed, that's, that's where we want to go. Because every son, I want to bless it. I want God to heal me, fill me with this, give me this gift, give me this money. It's all about me. If that's the reason why you're reading the Bible, then you've missed the point. God does bless God does do all kinds of things because he loves you, but that's not the point. If that's the reason why you're digging into the Bible and paying attention to church, you have missed the point. Let me show you the point of the scriptures. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. This is what God says about the Bible. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Some people, if you try it, this with them is trouble. But this is what the Bible says. This is what God says about his word. All scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, it didn't say so that the servant of God may be blessed. It says so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The whole point of reading this Bible, yes, you'll get blessed along the way. God is training you to do good work, to represent Jesus Christ, so that in the process you can expand the kingdom of God and lead others into the glorious presence of Jesus Christ. So if your relationship with Jesus is all about you, you done got it wrong. God has called all of us not only to be his friends, but to be servants of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God expects us to be doing good works. And if you're still breathing, you still have a chance to step up your game. And the more you step up your game, for real, not for show, but from the heart, is the more God is likely to bless you or to bless somebody you're connected with. We're done for today, but before we close... In case there's someone here who has never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and is giving some thought to repenting of their sins and becoming a believer, here's what the Bible says. Here's how you become a Christian. 
The Bible says in Romans chapter 9, verse, sorry, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. All heads bowed, all eyes closed, nobody looking around. If there's anybody here today who wants to give your life to Jesus for the very first time, just raise your hand where you are. Anybody? 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 It's always good to be in a house full of believers. Nonetheless, in case somebody's just making up their mind, let's say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, today, I choose to repent of my sins. I choose to believe that you died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. Come into my heart as Lord and Savior and write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer for the first time for real, then right now God is writing your name in the book of life and what God writes, no man erases.